Welcome to the Greener Way podcast. I'm your host and managing editor of FS Sustainability, Rachel Allen Backus. In this episode, brought to you by Real Index Investments, we'll be discussing how ESG data like gender diversity can assist in investment decisions. Real Index Investments Senior Quantitative Portfolio Manager, Dr. Joanna Nash, starts by explaining how the Systematic Equities Fund Manager uses ESG data, and particularly how analysis of the percentage of women on company boards and in senior management can be a signal of unpriced market return. Historically, people used to think of quants not necessarily sort of being great at at integrating ESG, but I think uh, as data has improved, uh, we've made a concerted effort to try and do that. And so the way we think about it is we look at it in sort of four pillars. So we look at sort of exclusions, which is where people normally think quants can sort of integrate ESG. We then look at it from a risk a metric. We look at it from the alpha sources of ESG and then also the stewardship and voting side. Can you give me a little bit more in terms of each of those? I'm particularly interested by this distinction between risk and then alpha source. And then I'd love to get into the engagement side a little bit as well. Yeah, sure. So in relation to when we think about the the risk side of it, there's been a lot of sort of research that potentially looking at ESG as a risk signal. We haven't found that yet, but there's definitely areas of it where there is risk that you need to be considerate of. So things like regulatory risks, especially in relation to environment. And so what we've tended to find is that those risks have been taken into account by looking at our, our carbon exposure and reducing that carbon exposure. Uh, we have some clients who, you know, like to reduce that risk totally and so exclude certain uh, um, stocks that may have uh, exposure to fossil fuels or others that may want to reduce their exposure to things like asset stranding. And so that's the way we tend to look at the the risk side of it at the moment. We do continually do research to see if there's other ways that we can incorporate that risk. And then on the alpha side, this has actually been sort of one of the, the more interesting parts for, for me anyway, is looking at different ESG data sources and seeing how we can potentially find alpha opportunities. And so the way that we think about this is like any other alpha signal, it has to sort of go through the same process, the same research process, the same hurdles in order to be incorporated into the model. But the thing that's really interesting with ESG is that it's getting at a company in a slightly different way. So we're not looking at at balance sheet data, we're not looking at what analysts are saying, but we're getting an idea of maybe how the company sort of, I guess, internally works by looking at sort of these ENS metrics, especially as well as the G for governance, but things like diversity and how that sort of works within the company. Uh, We look at things like carbon and not just in a way to reduce the risk, but we look at carbon as a proxy for the the company's productivity of their resources. So if you can produce the same amount with less input, you're being more productive and you tend to have a lower carbon emission. So we get this proxy for it. So we find these ESG data sources are really helpful at looking at a company in a slightly different way um, and potentially giving us alpha opportunities for our clients. That's really interesting, Joanna. And I'll tell you, when I interview quants, uh, it's one of my favorite questions of of all to ask whether or not ESG stands on its own as its own separate signal, uh, because the question is as variegated as colors in the rainbow. So from Real Index's perspective, (laughs) um, does ESG stand up as its own signal? And, And how does it sort of relate to other strategies like quality, value, momentum? Yeah, so in our model, we don't have it as its own separate bucket. Uh, We tend to put these ESG insights within sort of one of the the quality buckets is tend to where they do sit, as well as sometimes in the momentum bucket. Um, But what we do uh, make sure is that these ESG insights have to have the same sort of process as any other signal that puts into our model. We don't just sort of say, oh, it's ESG, we need to have that into our model, so we'll put it in there. It has to stand up to that same rigour. And so in that sense, it's it's its its, its own, I guess, being, but it doesn't tend to go into its own bucket. We tend to put it into other like-minded uh, signals, and we tend to find that the ESG uh, signals are giving us some sort of insight into to management or how the, the company is run. And so we tend to find that that goes into those quality type of metrics. <laughs> Schrodinger's signal, it both is and isn't at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Um, I want to drill in something you just mentioned before um, around gender diversity, because this was the subject of a paper uh, that you put out earlier this year that uh, my colleagues and I were really interested by. So you've identified gender diversity as an ESG alpha signal or potentially as a proxy for other signs. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit more on those findings? 
Yeah, no, this was a really interesting piece of work and uh, I guess I'll become a little bit more nerdy at the moment, but uh, it was something that I was heavily involved in with my uh, my colleague Ron Guido. And what we did is we, we've we always interested in, in gender diversity in the sense that people sort of say, look, you want to have a more diverse workforce because that would mean that the, you'll make better decisions and better decisions for a company should hopefully lead to, to greater profitability. And so as a quant, we like to put numbers around that. And so we want to see, well, let's see whether we could test this or not. And so we found this great data set, which allowed us to look at diversity over a time period. And I think that was really important to get sort of a, a, a decade, decade or so of time, which then allowed us to see what had happened over that time and how companies had adjusted. And although the, the initial sort of research was to look at that as an alpha signal, so, you know, does gender matter or does diversity matter? Unfortunately, we were looking at just gender because that was where we could get the data. Um, mm. It also gave us a sort of a, an insight as to how different countries had dealt with gender diversity and getting targets as well. So if I just look at the, the alpha signal part, because that was sort of the initial uh, part of the research, as I said, what we wanted to do and what we do with all our research was we have to have an investment thesis. So, you know, here we think more diverse teams make better decisions, so better decisions should be more profitable for companies, okay? So let's test that part first. And so what we did is we got this data over this 10-year period and saw, okay, is there benefit to this diversity or not? And again, part of having that sort of extended data set allowed us to do things like, okay, here's what the team looked like five years ago. Let's look at what profitability has been over those next five years. Because when you change people, you don't expect things to sort of change the next day. This is a longer mm. term uh, type of insight. And so what we could do is we looked at return on equity, we looked at profit margins, and what we saw is that firms that had more diversity both at, at the board level and at the senior management level both outperformed over that time period. So that was sort of, I guess, confirmed our thesis that said, okay, look, if you think about uh, better decisions, one proxy for that being sort of more profitability, we can see that coming through. The next step, of course, is then, okay, well, does the market know about it? Has the market priced it in? Because it could all be well and good that you've got this great insight, but if everyone knows about it, it's not really that helpful. And so what we then do is a number of a back test. And so again, having that sort of 10 or so year, 10 years worth of data allows us to do the back test to see whether there was benefit in betting or, or tilting towards those companies with greater diversity. And what I had initially thought would be, look, I think there'll be some benefit for board, but everyone knows about the board. Maybe there's going to be more benefit within the senior management. And so I was actually a little bit surprised. We found um, alpha opportunities at both the board and the senior management level, more at the senior management level, um, but there was still some benefit for not uh, not investing in those companies that have low diversity at the board level. And so that was pleasing for us. And that's sort of then the process that we go into to then incorporate that particular signal within our model. That's really fascinating, Joanna. Um, in terms of that time, that, that time set that you were able to establish, um, 10 years sounds like an awful lot, but I know that for a quantitative analysis, uh, it can be a pretty short time period given sort of longitudinal uh, studies and analysis. Um, do you feel that that 10 years um, was adequate uh, for this? Do you feel that uh, if you're able to you know, extend out over the coming years or were able to access another data set that's a bit older, that it might change the uh, sort of the back testing or the results in any significant sort of way? So obviously more data would be better. We always love more data. Um, but, uh, you know, we sort of, we had between about 10 and 15 years, depending on the particular mm. market. And that's pretty good. Uh, you know, as I said, more data is always better, but you've got to sort of, sometimes when you have too much data, you can be relying on things that happened 20 years ago and whether that's actually going to happen or not, you know, mm. now is also an issue. I think the thing that um, gave us some confidence in that is that what we saw over that time period is a lot of change that's happened in relation to diversity and especially targets um, that mm. different countries have set. And so that was actually one of the other interesting things that came out of the data was that we could see how gender diversity at, at board levels in particular had changed as companies had, not companies, as countries had introduced mm. different targets and things like that. So we could see the countries that had introduced legislative targets in relation to quotas, mm -hmm. ones that mm -hmm. had done disclosure and ones that had done nothing and how mm. quickly they had been able to reach the sort of gender diversity targets. And so that, that made it really interesting. And having seen that change go through and then still seeing the um, alpha insights hold as we saw that change, you had sort of a little bit more confidence that this was going to hold in sort of both times when there wasn't as much diversity and then when there's times when there's greater diversity. It's so fascinating, isn't it? Um, so then as a result of this analysis, Joanna, 
how have you then applied it or how will you apply it to your strategies going forward? I guess this is the the big so what question. Yeah, no, exactly. So having seen that there was that outperformance at both the, the senior management level and at the board level, we've mm. incorporated those two insights into our models at the moment. And so mm. our funds will tend to tilt towards companies that have greater diversity at senior management and at board level. What we will continue to do, though, is monitor the performance of those. So as mm-hmm. I said, there was less performance at the board level than at the senior management level. And that was a lot to do with the fact that there's been more focus on the board than the senior management. Mm. So more people know about it, more people are looking at it. And so you expect there to be less alpha opportunities. And so we saw that in our back test. And so we put less weight on that board signal versus the senior management signal. Um, for a quant, the senior management signal sort of required a lot more effort in relation to the mm. data, and so it's harder to get at, which potentially means not as many people are looking at it, which for us means greater opportunities. And so, again, that sort of that bore out in the back test, and we expect, and we, again, we'll continue to monitor that. But as mm. I said, those, both those signals have gone into our model within our mm. quality bucket, and so we'll be tilting towards those types of companies. Joanna Nash, Real Index Investments. Managing the risks and opportunities of gender and other markers of diversity is not just the realm of quantitative managers. The Australian Council of Superannuation Investors CEO, Louise Davidson, explains how engagement and stewardship can also assist. AXI is a collective engagement body which represents 26 Australian and international asset owners and institutional investors with more than a trillion dollars in funds under management. When we first started, I, I haven't got the exact figure in front of me, but you know we had, we had something like 8% of ASX directors were uh, were women, um, ASX 200 directors. Uh, now we're up over 30%. I think we're getting close to 35% now. So we've yeah. had really remarkable progress. Axie has been one of a number of players who've really pushed hard on this. And I guess as you've as you've identified, Rachel, our 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 view is that we need to keep evolving this process. So to begin with, we were really clear to companies that we expected at least 30% of the board ought to be women well mm-hmm. actually or men if 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 we have the same problem on the other on the other side um because okay. and, and the reason for identifying 30% it had some science behind it it was about making sure that you didn't just have one token woman you know making sure that there was a critical mass of uh, any particular group on the board and so um, once we started to see some really good progress there, as you've identified, we moved that away from just the ASX 200 to include the 300. And uh, I guess our, the policy that we then moved to uh, probably 18 months to two years ago now was that 40-40-20, which is 40% women, 40% men, and then 40, uh, 20% for flex. Um, and that was really, I, I guess I would say that as being equivalent of a 50-50 policy, except that 50-50 yeah. can be a little bit difficult to implement, you know, and so that having 40-40-20 allows for some flexibility for when people come on and off boards, et cetera. It's also uh, given that as our concept of uh, gender has expanded, having 40-40-20 um, allows us to develop boards that look resemble Australia more widely. Uh, I suppose it's also a corollary. Yeah, I think that's right. and I mean. As you will be all too well well aware, there is still, um, you know, there's still diversity challenges for um, for boards, um, and not least that we still are only at thirty five percent women, but also on broader questions of uh, diversity and particularly around ethnicity, I think uh, there's going to be, you know, that's going to be the next challenge for us to address, I think. And you can see they're already doing some work on on that in other jurisdictions, particularly in the UK at the moment. From Axie's membership perspective, Louise, um, do genders and other markers of diversity, and you know, I keep breadcrumbing that we'll get to other, what the further definition looks like, but we will. Um, does this actually, why does this actually matter? Is it about improving overall performance, mitigating risk? Is it purely reputational? Um, what's what's the benefit from the membership perspective? It's definitely about um, ab- about performance, improvement of overall performance. I mean, I guess reputation is part of that as well, inextricably linked with performance really, isn't it? But mm-hmm. um, I, I really see it as being about improving overall performance, bringing different sets of views to the table. Uh, I mean, our our view about boards is that diversity of thought is critical. Um, and I think that you, or you really strengthen diversity of thought by having 
people of both genders, uh, both male and female, on the board. One of the things that we think about is how, how do we how do we actually make sure that the conversations and questions around the board are broad enough. One of the things that I think we've seen a big increase in since we've had more women on boards has been a greater focus, for example, on how do we elevate women into the C-suite? How do we deal with sexual harassment within organisations? Some of those topics really weren't being considered at all when the overall majority, like the overwhelming majority of, of directors were male. What does this yes and approach to increasing diversity mean with AXI members? Um, what's the, you know, we've talked about, you know, cognitive diversity, ethnic and heritage diversity. How do the membership body working with AXI begin to expand this discussion and what will that look like going forward? Yeah, so uh, we, we are doing some work in this area at the moment and particularly looking at uh, examples that are occurring overseas to see, you know, how how well they are working, you know, so seeing, um, for example, how well the UK approach is working and um, I watch this space. We haven't, we, we, we haven't got the answers as yet, but we're yeah. certainly yeah. conscious that this is an issue that is, is really that it's time has come. It's time for, you know, a greater focus on different types of diversity. I mean, I think the other thing is, um, you know, we want people with, Obviously, we need people on boards who have, who are really have you know experience running large companies, experience in um, finance, experience in audit, etc. But we do want to have different life experiences brought to bear on the considerations in front of boards as well. And I, I just thinking about you know it, it, it's a really difficult nut to crack how you actually get the real a really broad and diverse set of views on a board. Mm. Um, I, I suspect it's not a question that will be answered, um, you know, anytime soon, but it's certainly right. something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, so gender and ethnicity can be proxies in a way, I suppose, for that, that broader, um, broader diversity of thought. How do you begin to break this down, Louise? Does this come to this question, you know, which sometimes seems like such a small point, but, you know, having a proper and robust uh, board skills matrix, for example, um, as sort of a, a way of developing that data to start pushing those considerations? Yeah, so I think the um, use of board skills matrix is is really useful. I, I guess um, um, whilst they are very important, I wonder if sometimes they um, – underplay some of the really important, let's call them for want of a better term, because I don't really like this term, but soft skills. Uh, mm. You know, I, I don't think I've really ever seen them clearly identified in a board skills matrix, and yet they are, of course, critically important. And so I guess, um, you know, what, what appears on a, a board skills matrix might well be um, a subset of what you, what you hope directors would be bringing to a board. But I think um, use of a, a board skills matrix and and really I think doing using school, skills matrices in a way that is not just tick box is really important, you know. So really for, for boards to really think about what might they have missed and what um, what else might be additive to their group. I, I join you. I really resent the term soft skills. To me, it's the analogous to uh, non-financial uh, mm -hmm. indicators. It's If it's something that's going to affect a balance sheet, it's a financial indicator. If it's a skill that's going to improve or impact on performance, it's not soft. <laughs> absolutely. No, I absolutely agree. And uh, uh, you, you've challenged me now, Rachel. I need to come up with a better way of expressing that. Louise, um, how then do you take this broadened and evolved definition of diversity and extend it into the engagement that AXI does um, on behalf of its members and in conjunction with its members? So what we do, the way, the way we think about engagement is that we identify issues that are financially material or have the potential to be financial, financially material for companies in our members' investment portfolios we identify the issue, then we look at the um, companies that we think will have the biggest exposure and we work closely with our members in that process. So we want to make sure that the companies that we choose to engage with have um, an exposure to the issue and are also financially material within our members' investment portfolios. Um, and then we uh, build that material into our 
regular meetings with the company. So most uh, we, we meet with most companies in the ASX 200 um, at least once a year, some of them um, some of the more often, particularly if there's, um, you know, a lot going on in, for that company. And so we will just make sure that uh, that each of those topics that is pertinent for that company is built into the structure of the meeting that we have with them. And so, and, and obviously, sometimes we might start a conversation by sending them a letter or, you know, uh, or, or at least letting them know that this is an issue that we want to raise with that com- company in advance so they have time to prepare for that. And usually engagement on a particular issue takes quite a lot of time. So you you start a conversation and that conversation might extend, depending on the issue, over many years. You know, for example, the fact that I've been, we've been working on this gender diversity issue for um, at least, well, I think actually it was one of the issues that Axie started looking at when we started in 2001. So that gives you an idea of how long that, that one's been on the slate for. You've been listening to Joanna Nash and Louise Davidson. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion, which was brought to you by Real Index Investments. Please remember you can subscribe to the Greener Way podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. I'm Rachel Allen Backus, Managing Editor of FS Sustainability. The Greener Way podcast is a product of FS Sustainability, a show about people, the planet, and investing in our collective future. All information in this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. The Greener Way podcast gives listeners access to information and educational content provided by discussing numerous financial sustainable options and our featured guests. It is not intended as a substitute for professional, legal, or tax advice. The hosts of The Greener Way are not financial professionals and are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. FS Sustainability operates under an Australian Financial Service License and the exemption made available under the Corporations Act 2001 in respect to any information or advice given. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. For more information, head to the disclaimer page on the FS Sustainability website, fssustainability.com.au.